today that says every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. Would you lift your hand toward heaven and say, I am one of those lights. It's not just talking about the lights that light up the night sky. Because, see, the Bible said you were sometime darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And part of the way you become light is by the reception of gifts from above. And when God pours his gifts into your life, you light up a dark world around you. Now, let me go through it again. Uh, uh, It's really the foundation of everything I have to say today. Every good and perfect gift, every good and perfect gift. So if it's perfect, nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken from it. Nothing uh, needs to be added to it or taken from it. It's perfect. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. Now watch this. With whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That means... Once God decides to gift you in a certain way, he doesn't change his mind. He doesn't change his mind. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. Now, if you're writing stuff down, and you should be writing stuff down, because you need to commit these things to memory. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, now the King James Version says, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. What does that mean? Well, It's referring to God, and it means that when he gives gifts, he doesn't repent of it. Now, we think of repentance as a sorrowful, mourning, grieving kind of thing, but it simply means the word translated in Hebrew and Greek into the word repent simply means to change your mind. So the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, it says in the New King James Version. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. In other words, when God gives them, he doesn't repent of having given them. Does that mean we can live any way we want to live and still walk around as very gifted people? Uh, No, because the gifts don't function in muddy waters. The gifts only function properly when you offer a, a life back to God that can showcase those gifts. What if someone gave you a Christmas gift that was wrapped up in a package coated with mud and grime and dirt and it's all torn and it's ripped? It's not going to be an effective gifting put into your life unless it's packaged right. Turn around to somebody, please, and look them right in the eye and say, I hope your package looks good today. Uh, because you are the package that the gift is deposited in, and the package has to match the gift in beauty and value, in perfection and goodness. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Uh, So thank God for that. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. The gifts and calling of God... God doesn't change his mind about. Amen. Everybody say amen to that. Elizabeth, would you help Destiny back there? I think she's going to need some help today. Uh, Let's go to the next scripture. uh, That's okay, uh, Prissy. We don't need you up there. Uh, All right, let's go to the fact that God's kingdom functions on a spirit of giving. Now say that with me, everyone, if you would, please. God's kingdom, say it after me, God's kingdom functions on a spirit of giving. Now think of that. Everything about the nature of the kingdom of God is giving. Everything about the nature of God is giving. And because God's nature permeates his kingdom, that's how the kingdom functions. Uh, I, I believe that the best illustration of that is John chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. John chapter 17 is that fantastic chapter that deals with the prayer, the intercessory prayer that Jesus prayed over the church. And he didn't just pray over those who were alive at that time. He prayed over all those who were yet to come. 
And he said, Father, I pray not only for these, but for all those that will believe on me through their words. So that includes me. Everybody say, that includes me. Now watch what he said. He starts out the prayer saying, Father, glorify thy son. Glorify thy son. And I'm using the old archaic English. I like it uh, sometimes. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. In other words, give it to me, I'll give it back to you. Everybody say that with me. Say, give it to me, I'll give it back to you. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. And then this is the key verse. Verse 2 says, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Can you see the circle of giving? Let me go through it again. As thou hast given him power, and the word is exousia, which means authority. You've given him authority. As thou hast given him exousia, as you have given him, I have a gift. The Son of God is saying, I have a gift. And it is authority to rescue people from a fallen human race. You have given me power over all flesh. I've got power over every single human being in the world. I have authority over every single human being in the world as you have given me power over all flesh that I should give. So you've given me something so that I can give it away. You've given me something so that I can impart it to others. No person in this room is supposed to be a cistern of the grace and the goodness and the gifts of God. Every one of us are channels for the gifts of God to flow out. The, the first time I went to Israel, I was really captivated by this thought because I found out, uh, maybe I was knowledgeable of it previously, but I found out for sure when I went to Israel that there's only two main bodies of water in Israel. You have the Sea of Galilee and, of course, the Gospels, Talk a lot about that region, the Galilee region. That's where Jesus ministered. And it's teeming with life and fishing industry. And then further south, down at the end of the Jordan River, you have the Dead Sea, which is the lowest point on the globe. Now, it's not exactly 1,300 feet, but it's about 1,300 feet below sea level. And the bottom of the Dead Sea is about another 12 or 1,300 feet. It's the lowest place on planet Earth. Think of that. And it is exactly what it implies. It's dead. Nothing can live there because of the high mineral content, because of the heavy salt content. No fish can exist in those waters. And, and I thought, well, how can that be? The Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea are both fed by the same source. It's the uh, River Jordan that flows from the northern area of Israel. And there's a story about that that's really interesting. When the, uh, uh, when the Romans had control of the, the Holy Land, they built the image of a god, around, a false god, a false deity, around the source of uh, the Jordan River up in the northern region, uh, the high uh, northern region, mountainous region of Israel. And uh, so they fixed it so that the water poured out of the mouth of this false god. And God, I believe it was God. God isn't always in charge of every natural disaster, but I believe this one was divinely ordained. God sent an earthquake, and it shifted the source of the river a couple hundred feet to the left. <laughs> That was God's humorous way of saying, you got it wrong, guys. <laughs> Let me readjust this. But the same water that flows into Galilee flows out the other side and then down into the Dead Sea. Why is one full of life and the other full of death? Because it flows into Galilee, but it also flows out. And once it flows into the Dead Sea, it remains there. It abides there. It doesn't go anywhere except through a little bit of evaporation. But other than that, it just stagnates. Isn't that the way people are? Come on. What God gifts you with, you've got to gift others with, or you stagnate spiritually. You have to be other-minded. Uh, I'm sure you're very familiar with the Salvation Army. I believe it's a great group of people. They used to be known more for preaching on the streets than uh, thrift stores. 
And I'd, I'd like to see that group get back more to evangelism as they were in the beginning. But uh, in the first year of their existence, General Booth, an amazing man, you should read the history of the Salvation Army. It's really interesting. General Booth uh, wanted to send out a Christmas card to all of the uh, workers that were working with him worldwide. And he only had enough money for the card stock and the printing of one word on that card stock. Think of that. He only had enough money to print one word. What's he going to print? Well, the, the printer said, I already know what you're going to print. You don't have to tell me. Uh, I'll put the name Jesus in that card. He said, no, absolutely not. And the man looked at him with shock. He said, you're going to send out a Christmas card and you're not going to put the name Jesus in it? General Booth said, absolutely not. He said, my workers already know that message very well. But there's another message they don't know so well. He said, put the word others on the inside of that card. And thousands of cards went out all around the world with the word others in it. Everybody say others. So gifted people become a gift. Whatever you receive is what you have the power to give away to others. Jesus demonstrated that or revealed that in that statement. Let me go back to it because I want to drive it home. As you have given me power over all flesh that I should give eternal life to as many as you have given me, in essence, is what he said. So there's a whole circle of giving here. The Father gives the Son authority. The Son gives eternal life to all those the Father has given him. So the Father's working both sides of the equation. He gives the Son authority to rescue people, but then he gives a certain people to the Son who will respond to him who will receive the gift of his influence. So uh, turn around to somebody, would you, and say, God's working both sides in your life. <laughs> he really is. He's working both sides in your life. Not only has he gifted you with abilities to advance his kingdom, he puts certain people in your path that he has gifted you with the ability to influence. Because one of the most enriching and one of the most joyful things in life is being able to give yourself away in such a way you see somebody else's life changed. Uh, you're not going to get anywhere near as happy over personal attainments, personal achievements, personal acquisitions of acquiring this and acquiring that and doing this and doing that. None of those things will fulfill you like being able to look at it and say, I helped that person. I changed this person. I ministered to that person, and I see a miracle in that life. That's why 1 Peter 4.10 says it this way, and I'd like you to repeat it after me. Everybody say, as every man has received the gift, so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You see that? As every man has received the gift. Now, we can walk around and put titles after our name. I'm apostle so-and-so. I'm prophet so-and-so. And, and of course, people call me pastor, but it's not a title. It's a function. It's a role. It's uh, something alive and meaningful, not just something to put on uh, a desk mount. But uh, we can claim all the titles Apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, or whatever your role may be. But it doesn't become real and it doesn't become relevant until you fill that role. That's why I get a little bit, um, how can I say it, suspicious of people that are too quick to title themselves. I get emails from people who have never uh, formed a church, who have never raised up a ministry, and they call themselves apostle so-and-so. <laughs> And I feel like saying, do the works, don't just bear the title. And if you do the works, you won't have to tout the title. It will automatically be applied to you. Many years ago, I want to share this with you. A very dear friend of mine called me up and said, I've got to share with you a dream that God gave me. And uh, sometimes I wince when people call me up and say, God gave me a dream about you. 
because, forgive me, but seven times out of ten, it's irrelevant and it's not really from God. Probably about seven times out of ten. And, and I appreciate people wanting to say what they say, but sometimes it's outlandish and way out and, and uh, not, not the Holy Spirit speaking. But this woman, I knew she walked with God and I knew she had a really deep prayer life, so I valued her opinion. And I said, well, what did God show you? She said it was a very peculiar dream. And uh, she saw me under a tent I used to have, a, a great big tent that would seat about, I don't know, 1,200 people. Uh, it was a big, beautiful blue tent with white curtains, light blue, sky blue tent with white curtains. And we used to carry a youth group around, up to 300 kids from one city to the next all summer long, to fire them up with real passion for souls. They would spend their days on the streets witnessing and in Bible studies. It was great. But uh, yeah, glory is right. It was fantastic. Many went into full-time ministry after those summers. But uh, I was standing on the platform of the tent, and she said, you were just beaming with this big smile and radiating the light of God. And she said, I heard the voice of God speak audibly over you. And she said it was very peculiar because I heard God say two things at, in one statement. She said one word overlapped the other. One word was superimposed on the other. And she said it was really weird. It was like uh, God's, uh, I'm glad people can't do that. <laughs> Women especially, I mean, they'd say five or six things all at once. God bless you, ladies. That's your role. That's your function. That's your gift. You're communicators usually, and men are reticent usually and quiet and hold things in. But uh, anyway, she heard God say two things. The overriding thing was be true to the gift God gave you. That was the dominant statement. Be true to the gift God gave you, but also at the same time she heard like an echo of the same voice, but one word was changed. Be true to the gift God made you. Be true to the gift God gave you. Be true to the gift God made you. And she said it was like God said, gave and made at the same time. And I said, that's so powerful because whatever God gives you is what God makes you. If God gives you a gift of joy, you become a gift of joy to others. Can I get an amen in the house? And does anybody know Elizabeth Shreve? She had, she received a gift of joy when she went through the most depressing thing she ever went through in life. She's always been really happy, uh, but nowhere near the happiness that emanates from her since she went through cancer. And God gave her the ability to enjoy life despite what she was facing. Uh, I, I believe, to be honest with you, I believe that's why the black culture is so good at just Worship. I mean, they get in and worship and enjoy God. And wow, I mean, when I preach in Africa, in Nigeria, the first time I went there, we'd start church at seven and never ended till after midnight. And they would shout and praise God and dance until 10 o'clock and then give me the platform. And they, they were very disappointed if I didn't preach at least two hours because they were just enjoying God. And I think they kind of... You can't say it's genetic, but it is culturally transferable from one generation to another. They've been so mistreated, so abused through the centuries that they learn how to enjoy life even when you're going through hellish circumstances. And uh, especially that was magnified when many of them became believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, think, think of somebody in your life that you... No, who's a believer, who's born again, who's right with God, that walks in a lot of peace. You get around them and you just feel the calmness penetrating you. You just feel the uh, placid kind of waters in their soul where you just want to take a deep breath and quit worrying about life. Well, that person has a gift of peace, but that person has become a gift of peace to you and to others. What's your gift? What gift do you have that you can give away to others? Think about it. Do you have a gift of joy, a gift of peace, 
Are you a very loving person? Are you a very forgiving person? Have you received forgiveness so you can give it away? Have you received compassion so you can give it away? Compassion is love that feels the pain of someone else. A lot of you needed God's compassion to lift you out of the ditch you got yourself in, but after it was all over, I guarantee you, you have the power to be compassionate toward other people. Many of your gifts, watch this now, many of your gifts, like jewels, are forged in the fire of tribulation. Because jewels like emeralds and rubies, those are forged in the magma of the core of the earth and spewed up through these volcanic channels that, that push them toward the surface of the planet. But those precious jewels are formed in really uh, hot and fiery uh, circumstances in your life. And every gift is a jewel. The Bible said a man's gift is like a jewel that turns every direction and attracts attention to his or her life. All right. Let's, uh, let's keep going with John chapter 17. All right, Jesus says, Father, glorify me, that, uh, glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life. Eternal life, eternal life. What a gift to as many as you have given him. And then as you proceed down through the prayer, he starts enumerating different things he came to give. He was heaven's greatest gift. Uh, the, the favorite verse of the church global is John 3.16. Quote it with me, church. Come on. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. All right? Notice, for God so loved that he what? For God so loved that he... So loving and giving go together. Don't tell me you love me unless you give into my life somehow, unless you give kindness, unless you give encouragement. Uh, uh, love can be a very empty statement. I love you. I love you. If it's not followed up with performance somehow. Boy, it got real quiet in here right then. Yes, men, go ahead and wash the dishes at least one time this year. It will be a tremendous affirmation of your love. Let it be done at least once a year. Okay? Give and it shall be given unto you. Wow. Say that one with me. Everybody say give and it shall be given unto you. I have noticed that the most generous people in life are usually the ones on the receiving end all the time. Every time you turn around, somebody's blessing them, someone's favoring them, someone's depositing something in that person's life that uh, you shake your head, wow, they just walk in the miraculous. It's because they're sowing all the time. Give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, and running over, men will give into your bosom. It's the way to live. It's the way to live. And uh, we need to all ramp up to a little bit higher level our giving uh, so that when we walk into a room to do a job, we're not just somber and sober and, and, and dull in our expression and get the job done and walk out. Every time you walk in a room and people are in there, be thinking. Go ahead and process it in your mind. Be thinking, who in here needs something that I can give? Who needs a little revelation in the word that would encourage them and set them on their path? Who in here needs me uh, to awaken faith or to awaken praise in their life? Because God will, sometimes you and I are completely oblivious to it, but God will constantly order your steps so that all through your day there's connecting links where the kingdom wants to connect with people through you and you're an emissary of the kingdom ready to give away what God has given you. Praise God. Now let's go through the rest of what Jesus said. There's four, prim five primary things, at least five, that he expresses in John chapter 17 that he came to give away. He said, Father, the word you have given me, I have given them. Free gratis. The word you have given me, 
I have given them. And so Jesus had a certain revelation of the kingdom of God, a certain revelation of God's purposes in the world, a certain revelation of God's redemptive plan that stretches from Adam in the past to the second coming in the future. He had this knowledge that he did not keep to himself. Don't, I'm urging you, I'm urging you, even if you get a spam phone call from a telemarketer, witness to him before you hang up. Don't just practically come as close to cursing as you can and still be a Christian and then slam the phone down. Go ahead and say, can I have a moment? Well, yeah, they want to make a sale. Yes, yes, you can have a moment. Have you ever experienced Jesus Christ coming into your heart? Why not? Why not take every opportunity that comes your way to be that connecting link and to give to others the word God has given you? Usually when God gives me a fresh insight that I've never seen before, I post it on Facebook and uh, everybody I meet during the day or talk to on the phone, I'll share a little snippet of what God's given me because I know if it excited my heart, it will excite their heart. And I want to spread excitement. I don't want to spread depression. There's enough depression in all of our lives. There's enough discouragement in all of our lives. There's enough regret in all of our lives. We need to just push those things to the background. This will produce a healthy marriage. It, what, if, what if every time you came into God's presence, you were explaining to him how depressed you were about this and how regretful you are about that and how miserable you are about this and how sad you are about that, then if I was God, I'd say, oh, no, that one's praying again. Oh, no, all I'm going to hear is a bunch of negativity. All I'm going to hear is a bunch of stuff clouding the atmosphere around that person's life. That's why the Bible says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. What if, a, what if a wife met her husband at the door when he comes home from work and immediately she's got a long list, a litany of every complaint, everything that's going wrong in the house, the washing machine's not working, the kids are crazy, this has gone wrong, that is going, you wait until you hear what happened at work, then he's wanting a sanctuary uh, where he can escape some of the pressure he's been through all day long. As soon as he comes through the door, or as soon as she comes through the door, start heaping positive statements on that person. Start heaping encouraging statements. Give away something nice, and you'll find out it comes back to you. Can I get an amen? So anyway, Jesus said, the word you've given me, I have given them. Now, I'm asking you a question. I want you to do an evaluation. I want you to do a self-analysis right now. Would you put one hand out like this and say, this represents, say that out loud, say, this represents all the revelation God's given me my whole life. And then put your other hand out and say, this represents the revelation I've given away to others. And then say, I hope it balances. Because if we've been skimpy with what we've given away and hoarded what we've received, that's not the way the kingdom functions. As every man receives the gift, and that's the composite gift. That's totally all. Actually, you've received dozens and dozens of gifts, and you're going to learn that. Uh, by the end of the sermon next Sunday, you're going to find out the totality of all the gifts God's given you. But uh, you can sum it all up in the singular term, the gift. The gift is a gift of gifts. As every man has received the gift, so minister the same one to another. All right, what else did Jesus give away? This is amazing. And this is very misunderstood. He said, Father, the glory you have given me, I have given them. I want you to personalize it right now. I know it seems far from reality if we're just uh, you know, part of the system of the way life works and the day-to-day -day mundane things that are demanded of us. But I, I believe you and I can break out of that and realize there's more to us and more to life than we are often cognizant of, but everybody say, I have the gift of 
The glory of God. Wow, what does that mean? Well, the glory of God has a lot of definitions. It's, it's like a diamond that has facets all over it. Multifaceted diamond, you can turn different ways and it flashes light different directions. Well, the glory of God has a lot of different definitions, but primarily the glory of God is God's personal and manifested presence. God's personal and manifested presence. It's not just, um, it, it, it's not just a knowledge that he's omniscient. He's everywhere all the time. It's actually when he breaks through into this realm in a very recognizable way, then the glory has come. The glory is God's manifested personal presence. But the glory of God is also his flawless character. Where do I get that? It means the perfection of his personality. I'm sure you would agree with me. God is perfect love. God is perfect joy. God is perfect peace. God is perfect wisdom. God is perfect knowledge. God is perfect authority. God is perfect in all of his ways. And the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So speaking of the perfection of his character. And when Jesus said, Father, the glory you've given me, I have. He put it in, I used to say it was the past tense, but I got rebuked by an English teacher. You know, even preachers need to get rebuked every now and then, but it was done in kindness. Uh, the, the friend that rebuked me was a pastor who taught English in high school for about 30, 40 years. So uh, he had a right. You know, if you're going to rebuke somebody, make sure you have the authority to rebuke and uh, the knowledge behind it. And he said, that is not the past tense. I said, well, what is it? It sounds like the past tense to me. Jesus said, the glory you've given me, I have given them. He said, that hasn't stopped. It would only be the past tense if it stopped. But people are still receiving of that promise. So I said, well, if it's not the past tense, what is it? He said, it's the present perfect tense. I said, well, what is the present perfect tense? He said, it's something that happens in the past but continues to the present and most likely will continue on into the future. Praise God. I said, praise God. So Jesus said, Father, the glory you've given me, I have given them. What does that mean I have? I have the personal manifested presence of God in my life. I feel his presence every day. And if you feel his presence, even if you don't feel it every day, if, if there is a, a, a personal expression of the Holy Spirit in your life that you're aware of from time to time, you are blessed of God indeed. What an amazing gift that the glory of God is in your life. And then secondly, you have the character of God in you, in your heart, and in your life, David, Prissy, Don, Terry, Shannon, you have the character of God in your life that empowers you to make good choices and to be a better person. Wow. Thank you for that gift. Anybody want to thank God for his glory in your life? Thank God for your manifest presence. Thank God for your character pouring into me. Because if I didn't have that character, I would be unholy. I would be mean. I would be selfish. I would be self-centered. I would be lustful. I would be hateful. I would be depressed. Thank God for the glory of God. More, Lord. <laughs> Anybody want to say more, Lord? I just want more of your glory in my life, more of your character, more of your goodness, more of your nature, more of your manifest presence. You ought to go home and read John 17 because that's not the only two gifts that he came to give. Well, actually, you've got three now. He said, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you've given him. So the number one gift is eternal life. I'm going to live forever. You might as well learn to like me. I'm going to be around a long time. So are you. Praise God. All right, so eternal life. And then we've received his word. Thank God. Thank God we have the word of God. That was one of the first visitations God gave me at the beginning of my salvation. I had such a battle in my mind over whether or not the Bible was literally God's inspired word. And God gave me the most awesome visitation where in a night dream, in a night vision, in a dream of the night, I saw Jesus standing before me, radiant, so radiant, he was blasting out light 
brighter than the sun. I couldn't even see the features of his face. And then all of a sudden he disappeared and in his place was an open book with golden print. And the print was Hebrew. Even though I didn't know Hebrew at the time, I intuitively recognized that was Hebrew print. The most significant thing about the book, though, is it was pulsating with a heartbeat. You know, like a heart it has an irregular beat. It was pulsating like it had a heartbeat. And every time it pulsated, a river of light poured off the pages into me and warmed me. It was like, it was like eating... Uh, Wasabi. <laughs> I mean, it burns to the bottom of the feet and to the core of the brain when you get too much of it. Has anybody in here ever eaten too much wasabi in one bite? Well, that's what it felt like supernaturally. And if you haven't eaten wasabi to that degree, you need to do it today just to have the experience. But anyway, uh, I woke up with this incredible feeling of this burning of the reality of God's presence in me, having looked at this book that was alive. It had a heartbeat. It was alive with the very life of God. Needless to say, I never doubted the Word of God after that, I still don't understand it. Connecting the links between the Old Testament, the way things happened in the Old Covenant, and the way things happen in the New Covenant, and meeting together in some kind of logical junction is still a challenge to me after 47 years of reading the Bible. I don't claim to understand it all. In fact, I understand less now than I did when I started. I had all the answers a couple years after I got saved. But uh, now, after over four decades of studying the Word, I see it from so many different angles. I see what, th there's got to be uh, divine inspiration to comprehend what God is saying. Amen? But, uh, but uh, anyway, I have, this, uh, I have this gift of the Word of God. So that's the second, uh, the third one. First, or the second one, I'm sorry, the gift of eternal life, then the gift of the word, and then the gift of the glory of God. But then you go on down through the prayer, and he said, Father, uh, the glory that you've given me, I have given them, watch this, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. So he's talking about, Two more gifts that he's given that he came into the world to just freely give away. And number one was his oneness with the Father. You talk about something that boggles my mind and certainly most likely has the same effect on you. For me to be able to say, I am just as one with the Father as Jesus, the firstborn son, sounds too audacious. It sounds prideful, boastful, arrogant, ridiculous. How could I ever make a statement like that? Because Jesus said it first. He said, Father, that they may be one, even as we are one. I don't know where that's going to take us, but I know we're on a journey that's spectacular. <laughs> this is quite an adventure, because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he, he kind of says it in a different way, but a really nice way. He, said, he was talking about how Jesus must reign until all enemies be subdued, and then he will deliver up the kingdom to the Father. Repeat these words, that God may be all in all. He said he's going to reign until all enemies are subdued. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. I believe this is in 1 Corinthians 15. And, and, and then, he will then the Son will deliver up the kingdom to the Father that God may be all in all. That's not talking about every human being. I, I have talked with people that are Christian universalists that take that word all and say that means everybody. Even Hitler one day is going to be fully manifested as the Son of God. No, absolutely not. Then the whole Bible becomes uh, absurd. Uh, the, uh, the teaching of Jesus, the contrast between children of darkness and children of light was completely unnecessary. No, uh, it's an, it's an all-inclusive statement that has logical limitations attached to it. When you say that God may be all in all, there's a logical limitation to that statement 
because you assume there's an assumption going on that that word all doesn't mean every single human being. It means every single person in a covenant relationship with God eternally. Yes. Now, if that be true, if God is going to express himself fully in every child of God, that they may be one even as we are one, and God is going to express himself fully in you and in me, what does that mean? Where are we headed? What kind of future destiny is unfolding before us? I know one thing, the hellish things you've gone through on the journey are preparing you for the heavenly things yet to come. Praise God. So go ahead and shout on your way because that oneness is a gift from God and the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. They're irrevocable. Once God gives it to you, let every demon in hell try to rip you to shreds. God's going to hang on to you. He said, my sheep are in my hand and nothing can pluck them out of my hand. Thank God. You may say, well, I'm holding on to God. That's why I'm still saved. No, God's holding on to you. That's why you're still saved. Perfection. Wow. Michael King, you're headed for perfection. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome, Rebecca, that Mike's headed for perfection? <laughs> and isn't that awesome that Rebecca's headed for perfection? And that little baby in your arms is already perfect in your eyes. Uh, I'm headed, come on, everybody say it with me. Say, I'm headed for perfection. Because that's one of the gifts. Father, the, the glory you've given me, I've given them. Why? that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. So if he's prayed absolute perfection into your future, you're going to get there. You're plodding your way through some very muddy waters to get there, but you'll get there as long as you hold on to the gifts that are holding on to you and cling to the grace that is clinging to you you're going to survive, child of God. Now, I've got a whole lot more I want to tell you. But I think if I'm going to sum up all of these things, oh, I left out an important gift. So you've got eternal life. You've got the word. You've got the glory of God. You've got the oneness with the Father, the firstborn son had. You have perfection that's already in you. Uh, the Bible's made it very clear that... Uh, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery hidden from ages and generations is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, Paul said, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Wow, I found my source of perfection. Turn around to somebody next to you and look them right in the eye, please. I know they're going to look at you with utter shock on their faces, but turn to them and say, I am perfect. That wasn't very, uh, uh, that, that statement didn't come out of your mouth with much confidence. Come on, I, I, trust me, trust me on it. You, you'll, you'll be able to justify what you just said and vindicate yourself after I'm through. Everybody do it again. Please turn around to somebody and say, I am perfect. I am perfect. But then lift your hand and say, in Christ. In Christ. See, his perfection flows down through me. And his blood on a daily hourly, moment-by-moment -moment basis, washes me clean, sanctifies me all over again, makes me the righteousness of God all over again. So in Christ, I already have perfection in a spiritual sense, but a fully manifested sense is coming. But then he identified one more tremendous, two more actually, tremendous gifts. And one of them is the love of God. He, he said, Father, uh, I've given unto them your name, that the love by which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. So he's talking about the gift of love. I wonder what kind of people we would be if love had not been deposited in our life. I guarantee you it's the love of God in David and Prissy's life that made them open the door to Anna and to Autumn and to the others you've helped. Uh, Normally, human beings care about their own little life. This, this is all that matters. But then when the love of God gets deposited in you, it busts the walls out. And all of a sudden, you see a hurting world, and you've got to give back somehow. The love of God is a gift. I receive the love of God. 
I receive the love of God. And he said that the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them and I in them. That's the superior gift of all gifts, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't give a planet. He didn't give a solar system. He didn't even get real generous and give a whole galaxy to secure our redemption. Exploding a galaxy, and that was the price of our atonement. He didn't have many sons and picked out just one and thought, well, I've got 100 left, so it won't be that much of a sacrifice. He gave the only son he had to rescue you. And you think you're not important to God? If nobody else in the world had responded but you, God still would have done it. God still would have done it just for you. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. You are a gifted person. You've received God's word. You've received God's glory. You've received God's love. And now you have a charge. And I'm going to end with this, and we're going to take this up again next week. And next week, you're really going to be amazed at some of the scriptures that come out next week. But... Uh, now you have a charge, because listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19. He said, all authority has been given to me. Again, the word is exousia. Uh, all authority has been given to me. All right? So he's standing there full of authority. What's he going to do with it? He's going to commission people. He has authority to influence. He has authority to change people's lives. And the first thing he does is say, go therefore and make disciples. It's not just enough to get people to pray a prayer of salvation. Anybody can say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I give you my life. Amen. And then go their way and keep drinking themselves drunk every weekend and living a party life and indulging in the lust of the flesh. God needs disciples, disciplined sons and daughters who are world changers and history makers. Can I get an amen to that? Not just people that are concerned about their own little war of personal problems, but someone who is concerned about the bigger war that's going on globally and how I can make a difference. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. Praise God. In other words, he's saying, this authority the Father's given me, I'm passing it to you. And you have the power to give away something that's going to immerse people and an old person is going to die and a new person is going to come forth from the waters. You go make disciples of all nations. And so maybe the best gift you can give away is your commitment to God replicated in other people so that they're not casual Christians, but they're strong in their commitment to the truth. Father God, you said, as every man has received the gift, so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Lord, grace manifests in so many different ways. There's so many people gifted in different ways in this room. One may be gifted to be a counselor. The other may be gifted to be a teacher. The other may be gifted to be an influencer in some way. But Lord, we just, I, I gather up all the gifts in the room and wonder with all the dozens and dozens and even hundreds of gifts that are deposited in the vessels in this room, how this little group could change the world in a significant way if we all understood our giftedness and if we all understood the responsibility that goes along with giftedness and not just an obligation, but Lord, a joyous obligation. The joy of my life, the joy of our lives should be giving away to others what you have given us, even as the woman at the well who as soon as she was gifted, Jesus, you said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that said to you, give me the drink, you'd ask of him and he'd give you living water. And that woman went running through her city saying, come see a man. And all of Samaria met the Messiah because of her effort, because she was gifted. She received the gift of God. 
right into her life, and immediately her community was gifted, her surroundings were affected, her city was changed, everything about the atmosphere of her life lit up with the light of truth. Lord God, thank you for the gifts you've given us. Can we lift our hearts and hands toward heaven right now and thank God for the gifts God has given you. Oh Lord, thank you for the things that are evidence 